one. Okay, we're back. We're live with Energy in America with uh, Lou Pugliarisi of uh, ePrink in Washington, D.C., except this time it's not exactly like that. It's Energy in America from Japan because that's where Lou is. Lou is in Tokyo? Hi, Lou. Yes. <laughs> tell us about Tokyo and tell us why you're there and tell us how that all connects with Energy in America. So, uh, as you may know, uh, Prime Minister Abe visited uh, Washington, D.C. and met with President Trump. And then they went to Mar-a-Lago in Florida and played golf. And during that visit, uh, they discussed uh, a lot of the issues, including uh, mutual security interests in the Pacific Rim, particularly concern over the uh, ballistic missile test by the North Korean government, which is up to a lot of interesting shenanigans these days. And, uh, but they also discussed uh, finding ways to expand trade. And uh, Prime Minister Abe raised the issue of expanded uh, LNG exports from the United States, not just to Japan, but to other countries in the Pacific Rim. And uh, finally, I think, since they don't have a lot of officials in place yet, they started to initiate a trade dialogue through Vice President uh, Pence and uh, Midi, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, Minister Seiko. So that's the main accomplishment. I don't think there were, there were not a lot of details about LNG exports, but in my meetings with ministry officials yesterday, a question came up of LNG deliveries to Hawaii. Ah, and what was the what was the discussion around that question? We really care a lot there, about this. There were two questions that were raised. One, would it be possible to get a Jones Act exemption so American ships could be used? Uh, or, no, if American ships were not used, which would probably be the likely right. case, there right. no. Uh, American LNG carriers, as far as I know. And my answer to that was, I think you could get an exemption for something like that because the shipments are small, and we already do some exemptions in the cruise lines mm -hmm. for special cases. So uh, so you would have a large shipment, say, of LNG to uh, um, <clears throat> Japan or Taiwan, and some small volumes could be dropped off for either uh, military use or power, power plant use in Hawaii. I pointed out that the governor of Hawaii, though, was opposed to any LNG shipments, and uh, they might have to wait a few years for a change in well, administration. Yeah, I mean, let me, uh, you know, I, I don't have to tell you that LNG is in, um, uh, uh, it's, um, what shall I say about LNG in Hawaii? The governor doesn't like it. Uh, yes. it, the uh, Hawaiian Electric has not um, has not embraced it. Uh, I don't know if they've turned it off, but they haven't embraced it. And um, and I, I think um, it, it has a it has a very uh, um, a very um, um, questionable future. It has a questionable future in Hawaii. Yeah, I, I, yes, I agree, and I, I, that was actually the message I, because of my discussions with you, Jay, I, I passed that message along, so I don't, it's not a critical issue for the efficiency of LNG shipments to the Pacific Rim, it is a kind of nice gesture in a way, mm -hmm. uh, connection, but I, I don't think, uh, as I say, it would require a change of uh, administration policy or administration in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, well, yeah, it has to be a pretty dramatic change because so yeah. much of energy policy in Hawaii is made by, oh, I don't know, um, the people. The people who come and take advantage of the transparency and who speak yeah. about it. There's, you know, a lot of environmentalists uh, who uh, characterize probably accurately uh, LNG as a fossil fuel. It's a fossil fuel, and, you know, they, right. uh, they're, um, um, they're dedicated uh, to uh, stopping all fossil fuel. You know? Right, if it turns out that... Uh, the renewable program in Hawaii uh, reaches some limit, let's say, and that they're stuck with a certain volume of uh, fuel oil as the fossil fuel, I suspect it could be raised again. Yeah, I don't think yeah no, I agree with you. It remains a possibility. And I don't think anybody can say the door is closed on LNG. Um, We've got to see what happens in, in the next few years. 
It could yeah. be that we, we do need it as originally contemplated as a bridge fuel um, and to you know, hedge against uh, you know, increasing prices for other sources of fuel, including oil, of course, and, and renewables. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a market, you know, among other things, it's a market issue as well as an environmental exactly. concern. Exactly. Yeah. So how do, the, how do the Japanese feel about LNG? Is it an important part of their portfolio? Yeah, so as you know, uh, a couple of issues for the Japanese on LNG. The first is that uh, after Fukushima, virtually all the uh, nuclear power plants were shut down. Um, I know I sent you some data from 2014, which shows no nuclear power in Japan, but in fact, I think they've got at least a couple running and another one scheduled to come on soon. Uh, the basic issue for the Japanese there is that when they lost their nuclear power, they had to switch to both fuel oil and direct crude burn to make up some of the shortfall. So mm -hmm. they've had a, an aggressive renewable program. So. This is one of the reasons, there are two reasons for LNG. One, it's a, it's a clean fuel that fits into their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And specifically, they're interested in the U.S., not just for sort of reinforcing trade and security relationships, but also that if you're a big purchaser of LNG, such as the Japanese, you want to have a portfolio of sources. You don't want to rely just on the Middle East or just on Australia. You want to have a broad set of uh, suppliers. Isn't that true? You know, we, we talked about that here in Hawaii in, oh, way back in the 2008 <clears throat> anyway, if not before, if not way back before then, uh, that we don't want to be dependent on any particular uh, geopolitical re region. Uh, yeah. and, and since then, in recent years, gee, in the last three or four years, it became clear that geopolitical re regions from which we obtain oil could be destabilized any, any time and if that's the case, it's not even a question of price. Um, it's a question of whether you can get it at all. Uh, and I think, I think that thinking is now international. It's global thinking. If, if the region from which the fuel comes from is not reliable, uh, you, you shouldn't rely on it. Simple, yeah. <laughs> yes, but uh, oddly enough, I would think that most of that risk for oil, for crude oil, is... It's lower in terms of reliability, you know, in, the, in terms of uh, where you get it, because there are lots of production centers. So I, I just don't think it's a big problem. But it does have a higher price risk. Mm -hmm. uh, LNG, I would say, because the number of production centers are small, mm -hmm. are relatively few, uh, it may have a relatively low price risk, but it will have a more of a, of a diversification risk is high because there aren't that many places you can go to. Well, that, that, calls, that calls for an interesting point. Uh, and that is, uh, if, if the number of uh, uh, processing air plants which uh, uh, create LNG is small, but the market seems to be growing worldwide for LNG. I mean, people like it. It's, they're finding a place for it in many countries. Um, then does it follow that we will soon enough have more processing plants in more places? It'll be more uh, commodification of LNG, don't you think? Absolutely. That is actually the, the theme of the Japanese policy initiative. And uh, to make the LNG market look more like the crude oil market. So, And how you do that is you encourage the development of LNG sources outside the traditional suppliers, which they are doing. Yeah. So as you get more supplies from the Gulf Coast or the West Coast of the United States, it could be Rosarita and Long Beach, Jordan Cove and Oregon, Sabine Pass and the Gulf. All these different places do raise the potential for more suppliers. In fact, even Mexico is looking at, uh, in Baja, California, where they have a big import facility, to bring U.S. gas by pipeline to Baja, California, and then re-export re it there as LNG. Oh, uh, that also uh, it takes me to the question of whether that would be subject to these new tariffs that the Trump administration is considering. If we're, if we're going to import oil from, say, Mexico or, or LNG from Mexico, whatever kind of fuel we import from them, is that subject to that 20% tariff they were thinking about? That would be subject to the border adjustment tax, which really is not a Trump proposal as much as a Republican House proposal from Speaker Ryan, but the information from the last couple of days and folks I've talked to suggest that 
It wasn't a very warm welcome for this border adjustment <laughs> tax in the Senate. And, but it is a dilemma because if we're going to get tax reform, both corporate tax reform and uh, personal income tax reform, they're going to have to find money somewhere else. And uh, there is some discussion. You know, recently, a lot of Republican luminaries like former Secretary Schultz, former Secretary of State Baker, George Mankow have all written op-eds and even met with White House staff to talk about a carbon tax. Uh, we're in transitional times. Uh, but let me ask you, before we go to the break, Lou, I just want to know why you're in Japan. Is this professional or is it personal? Is it, is it, no, uh, I was in Japan and I, I participated in an annual uh, petroleum and energy seminar for the, both the government and the industrial and petroleum companies in Tokyo. We do it every year. And there were three of us. There was Basim Fatu from the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies. There was me and uh, uh, Mr. Tazarian from uh, uh, France, who had a very bleak picture about <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> so he was very entertaining. <laughs> he wouldn't be the only one. <laughs> but but yeah. what, no. So you're going to present and give them, you know, your think tank views about uh, yes, about energy. I hope he did it. I'll send you the PowerPoint and when we hang up, so you can enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> you have trouble sleeping at night. But what I'll do you get from you. them, Lou? I mean, you know, you're there, and of course you're in a do si do, elbow to elbow with all these people who are interested in energy from the Japanese point of view, and maybe from other countries too who attend the conference. Yeah. What are you getting from them? Who are they, and what are you getting from them? So I'm getting from them is that actually the Japanese are quite uh, relaxed. They feel that actually uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, like uh, President Trump, have uh, some similar outlook on the on the world. Their primary their primary concern is that there be no deterioration of the security relationship. They're absolutely uh, concerned about two major trouble spots. One is the expansion of the Chinese, uh, uh, particularly naval forces in the, in the, throughout the South China Sea, the, Kore the North Koreans, and uh, I think behind the scenes also the northern territories or islands, you know, the Japanese still do not have a peace treaty with the Russians mm -hmm. from World War II. And they're still working on that. And there's some <laughs> northern territories that would like to be returned. I call them long range projects. <laughs> well, let's take a short break, Lou. Lou Pudirisi of EPRINC in Washington, but not in Washington, in Tokyo instead, attending and presenting at a conference about energy there. When we come back, I want to talk more about geopolitics and how the, you know, how the formula, how, how the um, algorithm has changed in this administration uh, between geopolitics and energy. We'll be right back. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at three in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying five billion dollars a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. One. Bingo, it's almost lunchtime in <laughs> Tokyo, and Lou was talking about the sushi place around the corner, and <laughs> the food is so good in Tokyo, no kidding. Are you enjoying it? Yes, I come here every year, and I'll probably be coming back in a few months. So. <laughs> Are you staying in downtown at the Ginza, or where? I'm in, yeah, I'm very close to the Ginza, not too far. I'm at the, across the street from the United States Embassy. Oh, very and, uh, nice. The Okoro Hotel. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. What a lovely trip. And if you go every year, I'm sure you, you know the ropes, you know how to get along, you know where to go yeah. and all that. Right. Japan right. is such a comfortable place to travel to, isn't it? Yeah. So revisiting the issue you raised just before the break uh, about, you know, the geopolitics in the South China Sea and elsewhere in Asia, 
what you have is an uncertainty and maybe a, an intimidation factor from China. Um, that's got to affect, um, you know, the cost and risk of shipping uh, fossil fuel, including, I suppose, uh, not only oil, but LNG. Um, and therefore, it's got to have an effect on global markets for fuel. And uh, therefore, it's also got to have an indirect effect on, on um, photovoltaic and renewables as well. So can you talk about how, uh, you know, all this trouble in the South China Sea and maybe other places coming, coming soon affect the global markets and affect the way these countries and the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, reshape their ways of getting sources of fuel, uh, of energy? So, you know, historically, there has been concerns about uh, security supply and uh, the potential for at least prices to spike because of uh, insecure and expensive supplies of crude oil. I, I do think the shale, the shale, the oil shale revolution, the diversification of supplies, a lot of the measures on efficiency that we've undertaken in the West have changed the dynamics of that issue. I'm not saying it's not a problem. It's, it is a problem, but for Japan, um, uh, they, their concern about access uh, to, let's say, overseas supplies of LNG or crude oil are less concerned about sea lanes of communication and more about uh, uh, you know, pro problems at the production centers. And also keep in mind that some of the Chinese build-out, of course, is to spread their influence and uh, power throughout the South China Sea. It's also because they import a lot of it and want to keep that the, the, those supplies flowing. So it's a, an interesting diplomatic and security issue that's going to be worked out. But to your point, I would say, yes, concern over geopolitical risk, concern over financial risk, and concern over climate have led the major countries in both the Pacific and the U.S. to begin to install more renewable power, particularly in the for electric generation. I think I... We might have a table you can pull up. Uh, if not, I can give you some of the numbers. Um, well, there's a table for you. Yeah, okay. So if you look at this date, one thing is that I really, all your readers, when they ever see this presentation, you'll see a very big renewable number. It's very important to ask how much of that renewable number is hydroelectric power. People like to show enormous progress on renewables, but they forget to tell us that sometimes a large percentage of it is hydropower. U.S. US analysts, uh, U.S. policy folks do that a lot. They say, well, we're up to 12% renewables in the U.S. Well, that's actually not true in, if you're thinking just about solar and wind. Mm -hmm. Actually, our renewables are 6.9% mm -hmm. in 2014. They're slightly larger. Also, this table, I believe, and I need to double check this, is not necessary how much is generated, but it's installed capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so that's something to keep in mind. There are, I am impressed at the high level of renewable penetration by Germany and Spain. You'll notice that the US and Japan are at the lower end and uh, still a lot of reliance upon coal. Mm -hmm. But here on the issue of coal, you know, in the U.S., coal can, will continue to be, continue to struggle, even with the new regulations and policy initiatives uh, promoted by President Trump. And the reason for this is that natural gas is really cheap. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, right. pub, and, and decisions on power plants are not made by the federal government. Yeah. They're made by the states and the public utilities. Uh, how do you reconcile that with the article that I saw in the Times this morning to the effect that uh, coal, mine, coal mining companies are now making money uh, and that they're in the black? That's a pun, you know. That, that's definitely a play on words. Yeah. <laughs> they're, now, they're now in the black and, and they, they attribute that to Trump. It could, be, it could be that first, you know, they sort of had their cost structure beat back. I and mean, there's a lot of people who used to be do coal mining and companies that don't exist anymore. So we have a much smaller number of coal mining mm -hmm. companies. Uh, and uh, it, there may be a set of expectations that could do more exports. And I, I do think the big change for Trump will not be that uh, we'll be expanding coal, but the rate of decline will clearly slow down a lot. Mm -hmm. So... Without the clean power plant, the number of coal 
plants in the U.S. will not decline as rapidly. Well, you know, uh, so wrapping around this, it uh, seems to me that when, when I was a kid, and you probably had the same experience back when, Luke, my mother used to say to me, it's so great that you live in the best country in the world. You should wake <laughs> up every morning and give thanks to God that you live in the United States of America. You know, and I mean, I've been, I mean, people have been questioning that, and I've been questioning, you know, maybe if she were alive today, maybe she would have a different view of things from what's going on. And, and, and I saw in the paper also this morning that life expectancy in, the, in this country, which used to be so terrific, is actually not as good relative to other countries anymore. Um, and, you know, we have problems. Um, so, the so question I can tell you an interesting statistic. Yeah. If World War II, almost overnight, the armed forces removed 40% of the doctors, right? Because mm -hmm. they had to put them into put them work in the in the armed forces, mm -hmm. and the health data of the U.S. did not deteriorate at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, the factors that affect I mean, I mean, healthcare is quite important. Of course, I don't want to make a joke of that, but you know, I have a friend who does a lot of research in this area, and uh, there are other factors that affect your, you know, uh, of opioid use, and uh, there's a lot of other things having little to do with the delivery of healthcare that uh, affect people's uh, longevity. So I would be careful with those uh, media conclusion on those. Of course. And income levels. Income levels hurt your ability to live a long Sure, time. a direct effect, sure. But let me, let me, you know, take that down the road to the question of energy. Now, you, you showed us a chart, and the chart shows, uh, you know, distribution um, of, of uh, you know, re distribution of energy sources in various countries. And um, I don't know if you can say that, um, you know, the, the U.S. is better than all of them. I'm not sure. Uh, certainly there are countries uh, elsewhere in the world that are trying really hard to be renewables. I remember um, I was traveling in Europe last summer, and uh, there were a couple of countries in Europe that, for a time, because they were using wind, were 100% renewable. 100%. Just for a so brief he, he, time. Here's, here's the problem. If this is not a local air pollution that problem you're concerned about, but climate, which is loading of carbon or carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and other so-called global warming gases. Mm -hmm. If this is the central problem, this is an Asian problem because the U.S. as a, the U.S. has its carbon emissions have declined dramatically. And if you take all the measures that the President Obama was so interested in, for example, stopping the Keystone XL pipeline or implementing the clean power plan those measures in themselves had no effect on estimates of global warming or climate uh -huh. if you ran the ipcc models from the united nations right. we would have no effect the problem is what will china and india do this is like all the silly stuff people do in hawaii it's a small country i mean it's a small state small population who cares what Hawaii does, okay? <laughs> I mean, this is really, you know, this is like the Hawaii, if Hawaiians want to wear a hair shirt, it's their business, but <laughs> and I know a large delegation from of energy analysts and climate specialists went to India about two months ago, and they went through all the climate things the Indians could do, right? More LNG, efficiency, and stuff. And at the end of this meeting, the energy minister got up, and he said, you know, I ah, thank you for all coming, you know, I, you, as you might, may not know, we really don't like to take advice from you guys. And we're going to go ahead and build a lot of coal plants because we're a poor country and we need cheap power. Uh -huh. But thank you nevertheless. So this is a real problem. Our climate strategy is largely based on leadership, which we get other people to go along. And no one is talking about whether that's working or not. But, but what, what would you say if I, if I suggested that over time, some of these other countries are going to be focused, not, not today necessarily, and economics rules, of course, but they're going to be focused on going to renewables for various reasons, including geopolitical reasons. And while this country, under the Trump administration, is trying to encourage coal and, and oil pipelines and what have you, and, and not focusing so much as it was under Obama on renewables and solar and all that. So we're going in one direction. Some of these other countries are going 
in other directions, there may come a time when the crosshairs match. And in fact, the U.S. is, is doing less renewables on a per capita percentage basis than some countries that surprise us uh, with their progress in this area. Um, yeah, is that coming that's soon? Quite, that's quite possible, but there are two facts alike. One, power demand is growing extremely slow in the U.S. Mm. We are going to naturally go through a process where coal plants retire and they are substituted by natural gas or renewables or fuel of, or efficiency standards, right? We just are not going to see big growth in uh, electric generation in the United States. So you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels on this and gnashing your teeth. I don't think that you can't really move the numbers a lot. The, a lot of this is symbolism that politicians love to play with. <laughs> sure. So, well, so right, if, if we lived in a world in which we just had people who were all very reasonable, it would probably be the cheapest solution would be for the U.S. and the West to pay the Indians and the Chinese to convert at a faster rate. There you That's go. The, you uh, have on think tech. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a great solution. But, but let me ask, you know, in Japan, this is my, my last question of our show here today, sure. in Japan where you are enjoying not only the sushi but the, the, the environment in general, um, yeah. how much fervor is there? How ardent are people uh, in a clean energy initiative? Uh, how, how, I, I guess they got concerned over, uh, you know, the nuclear uh, incident a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. are, are they running a mile a minute away from that? Are they running from coal? Are they trying to get... How ardent are they in moving to renewables? Actually, the, China, the, the Japanese will be building a new coal plant, a supercritical coal plant. Not carbon capture and storage, but a supercritical one is on the board. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can overestimate... The, uh, you know, the driving force for renewables is really the concern over nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And that's a much longer story than we can do today, but... Because, you know, Fukushima, there were some mistakes at Fukushima, but the real problem was the tile way. I mean, the, the, and, and the way some of the safety procedures on the, on the backup power was at Fukushima. But, yeah, something so, like that happened, comes along, and all of a sudden it gets everybody's yeah. attention, and that's likely to happen again if, if the same kind of uh, tra tragedy repeats. Well, Lou, I, I really love talking to you in Japan. Uh, you know, Hawaii is so interested in everything that happens in Japan, and we are yeah. interested in your adventures in Japan. And uh, I'm so glad we, we got the hook up with you. And uh, I guess sir, for our next show, you'll be back in Washington. Is that true? I will. I'll be in Cyprus next week, but the week after, I'll be in Washington. Well, have a good trip back. Enjoy, and I look forward to talking with you again. Catch up again. It's great to talk to you. Lou, Lou Pugliarisi of ePrint, talking about energy in America and elsewhere.